Greetings once again, AP Calculus PC students. Mr. Record here for our second to our last video over topic 6.13, improper integration. In our example eight, we're gonna finally look at an example that features an interior discontinuity. And that's a little bit different from the previous couple of examples that we've looked at. Let's take a look at that question right now. It says we want to evaluate the definite integral from negative 1 to 2 of 1 over x cubed with respect to x. Now what I hope that you see is that this denominator has an issue. x cubed cannot equal 0 because that's going to pose some issues. And x cubed does not equal 0 occurs when ever we know that x can equal zero, right? So if x is equal to zero, in other words, we have problems right from the very beginning of the situation. And it turns out that zero is between our negative one and our positive two. So we have to reconcile this discontinuity. And I've got a picture here of the graph of one over x cubed. So you can see at x equals zero, we have this y, um, I'm sorry, this vertical um, asymptote here at the y-axis, and that's indeed what this curve would do. We, we would continually approach the y-axis from the right side, but never touch that y-axis. So I mentioned you have to reconcile the discontinuity. Well, how do we do that? Well, what you'll do is you'll just rewrite this integral with a limit statement in front. It's perfectly acceptable to start it at negative 1. After all, that's not where the problem is, but we cannot take this any farther past zero. In fact, we cannot even take it to zero. We have to take it just to the left of zero. And so the way that we'll outsmart that is we'll put some arbitrary constant here. I choose C for my interior discontinuities. I know we used A for a lower limit that we replaced earlier, a B for an upper limit that we replaced earlier. But if I'm using an interior discontinuity, I tend to use C. You can pretty much use any letter that you want. I'd stay away from x though. And then we can let c approach that 0. Now, here's the tricky part. There's only one way that you can approach 0, and you want to make sure that you declare that, and that is from the left. How do you know that? Well, if negative 1 is where you're starting and 0 is where you're ending, let's say that these are two values on a number line, obviously, all we have at our disposal are numbers that are to the left of zero. Is this going to be important? It very well may be important any year on the advanced placement test. It's certainly important on my tests. I like to make sure that we, we, we write these out. So these kinds of problems often are not found on the free response part of the AP exam, but they are very popular on the multiple choice. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we uh, move through this example. So I would try to get in the habit of using the correct one-sided notation. Again, we have 1 over x cubed with respect to x. And then what we're going to do is we're going to just pick up where we left off with another integral that's going to start at that value of c and end up at 2. And I'll go ahead and write the 1 over x cubed dx again. However, our limit now is a bit different. Now our c is going to approach that same guy 0, but take a guess from which side? I heard you. You're right. From the right side. Good job. So we'd put a plus sign after the 0. Now you just work through these two limits. So the integration of 1 over x cubed, well, you can think of 1 over x cubed as being x to the negative 3. And so when we integrate that, we end up with... I believe, uh, what did we say? We did this, I think, when in a previous example, but it's x to the negative 2 over negative 2. So if I rewrite that, that would be negative 1 over 2x squared is probably the nicest way to write that. Okay, now I still have my boundaries, c down to negative 1, and I still have my limit in front, so I don't want to lose track of all that. We'll do the same thing over here, have my limit written, my antiderivative result, and my boundaries. All right, now we complete our fundamental theorem. Our limits are being quite patient here, just waiting for us to 
get this thing all simplified. Negative 1 over 2c squared minus, and if I plug negative 1 in for this x, I would have 1 half, but there's already a negative in front of that, so the double negative would change to a plus, and I have just 1 over 2 there. Hopefully you guys follow that okay. And we'll do the same thing with our second expression. C approaches positive infinity. This time plug 2 in, negative 1 over 2 times 4 would be 8, minus negative, plug C in, and I have 1 over 2c squared. Now, what comes next? A couple of things. It's very important that we don't try to cancel these two expressions. And I'm going to tell you why. We have some things that we have to do with those expressions. We have limits that we have to take. You could almost think of this as an order of operations problem. You know, we have to do the work that's in the parentheses first before we can combine like terms. I think that's a very viable way to think of this. So resist the temptation to do any canceling there. Take the limit and let's see what we get. C is going to become really small. And it turns out it doesn't matter so much if it gets small from the positive side or the negative side because we're going to square. So when we think about this, negative 1 over 2 times something really small, almost close to 0, that squared is probably going to get even smaller. Remember, if you square decimal values that are less than 1 between 0 and 1, your result's actually smaller. It's the only time that you can square things and get something smaller. So this is going to be 1, I'm sorry, negative 1 over something really super small. And we have talked about how that results in an infinity. In this case, it is indeed negative infinity. And the wonderful thing about this is once you see that, you can bail out of the rest of this problem and basically ignore it because the answer is going to be diverge. If any part, if either one of these two limits has an infinity result in it, you can say that the answer is going to be divergent. Now, if, if you wanted to see how the rest of this worked, you would have the constant of a half here, of course, and then you'd have this minus 1 eighth, of course, and then another plus basically 1 over small is going to produce an infinity. And I know that this doesn't make a lot of sense mathematically. I'm going to write this nonetheless, but this is kind of what you're looking at. Now, I, I don't know if this is good stuff to put in equals after, and I would avoid that because you don't want to link this to these limits because whenever you link things with equal signs, you run the risk of potentially not earning a point on the AP exam because of a communication linkage error. So that's why I'm staying away from writing equals and just using a vertical approach. But again, I want you to realize these infinities cannot cancel. We don't know what levels of infinity they are. Infinity is not a number. It's a concept. You can't cancel concepts like that. So we have to leave them as they are. And the fact that an infinity shows up in any place in those terms means that this answer diverges. If you look a little bit more closely at the graph, I think we can kind of gain some insight. And, and I know that I didn't do a super good job of, of, of giving you the complete graph of 1 over x cubed, but it actually does have uh, some pieces to it that are over here. And shame on me if we're not doing a real good job of presenting that. But when we integrate from negative 1 to positive 2, we're essentially saying that we're going to try to find all of this infinite space in between the curve and, and the x-axis that's just frankly too big to count. right? You can almost chalk it up to the fact that there's just too much space in between the curve and the y-axis to give us a finite area. And I'm, I'm okay if students think that way, although you don't ever want to rely on the graph deciding whether or not you diverge or not. Now, here's the part that I want everyone watching this video to pay close attention to, because I've talked about how you can be 
lazy sometimes when you do a definite integral, or an improper integral, I should say, on a multiple choice question. This is not the one. If a student integrates this, and let's say they integrate it correctly, that's what we got, right? And they just haphazardly plug in the boundaries. And they plug them in. Everything seems to be going OK. Minus, plug in negative 1. That gives us negative half. It doesn't take a lot to see that this is going to be negative 1 eighth plus 1 half or plus 4 eighths. And you're going to think that you got a finite answer of 3 eighths. And what are the chances that this is going to be a distractor? In other words, it's going to be one of the incorrect multiple choice options. I can't spell distractor there, but you get what I'm saying. Well, there's a very good chance that that's going to happen. And the actual answer for this would be diverges. So you got to be very careful. And that's why we set out this limit statement process so that you can always do your improper integrals correctly. I hope this video is helpful. We are going to follow it up with one final video that's going to feature a couple of different kinds of uh, improper instances, and that would round out our lessons for topic 613. Anyway, we hope to see you next time.